Welcome to Valmount Votes. This is VCTV's series of interviews for uh, candidates for municipal election, for council, for mayor. We're also interviewing the candidates for the regional district uh, area H representative and the school district 57 Robson Valley representative. And here today we are here with Rita Rewerts, who is a candidate for council. Welcome, Rita. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael, for hosting this and all the questions to VCTV. Oh, great. Well, thank you for being here. It'd be great to hear what you have to say on some of the issues. Um, let's get started by getting to know you a little bit. Why don't you tell people a little bit about yourself? Well, uh, I was born and raised in Saskatchewan, of course, in the political heyday of Defen Baker and Tommy Douglas, and everything was political. It was socially acceptable to be political. It was part of the social fabric of your community to make your community strong and to be engaged. Youth were involved. There was youth groups for every political party. We had Young Parliament of Canada. So right from an early age, um, I was taught that you need to be engaged with your community. So I've always throughout my life been engaged with my community, and right from my upbringing in Saskatchewan. And that followed me out here when I moved to BC as a teenager. And I moved to BC, lived in Vanderhoof for several years and worked in Vanderhoof for several years, decided that I was gonna go back and become a medical professional. So I went to university on Vancouver Island for way too many years <laughs> and, and, uh, and enjoyed it, ha had a thirst for knowledge and worked in the medical profession for many years down at Vancouver Island in all aspects of what I tended to change around because I specialized in palliative care and occupational therapy and independent living and I would do contracts for the Ministry of Children and Families, for ICBC, for occupational therapy for people who were paralyzed and they needed to learn how to live in their community again and made me need to have their house redesigned in order for them to accommodate them. So I specialized in that and then I worked a lot in palliative care as well. And uh, so I enjoyed that and, and then we moved up to northern BC because there was an economic downturn and we had a, a opportunity to buy property here so we moved up here and I absolutely loved it because this was really a community. This was a community that knew it was a community, wanted to be a community, wanted to build the community to be stronger and I went to work in the hospitality industry which is I worked for one of the motor inns here in town and and learned about that and tourism and respect to this area and and then of course then there was the downturn here with the first the cutbacks at the mill leading up to the closure and my partner was transferred to Mackenzie so I moved to Mackenzie and I said well we kept our place here and I said well I'm going to give this three months and if I get a job then I'll stay in Mackenzie if not I'm going to go back and and work in Valmont again and during that time, I was uh, the chair of an advisory committee for the Regional Health Board, and I, I chaired that committee for almost a decade. And we advised uh, the Regional Health Board for the whole Northern Interior, right from Burns Lake out to here and down to Quinell and north of Chetwin on, on different matters in respect to health care in the communities. And I really, really enjoyed that. Um, I was quite surprised. Uh, UBC recruited me and asked me to come and be a part of that. So I, I did and I enjoyed that. And, and then in McKenzie, uh, I got a job as a chamber executive director there, chamber executive administrator. And, and in that uh, role, I had many hats. It was We worked with the village on economic development and we did community futures programming for self-employed benefits and so I delivered that programming and helped business starts and learned all about business starts and also was a part of the Northern Tourism Association and we I learned how to lobby through that job and to lobby the government and the different aspects of government I was able to get uh, Provincial Park reinstated in my role there that it had been a decommissioned and I had lobbied and took the provincial government on and was able to get the re provincial park reinstated and that was a happy moment. It was really important that that pristine area was kept in a pristine state as a provincial park and not to be exploited and things like that. So I enjoyed that. I learned how to lobby at a very high level um, Mackenzie is the largest timber supply area in the world, so it had a lot of economic strength in the province, and I learned to how to lobby through the BC Chamber of Commerce at a high level. Uh, brought in uh, uh, 
conference that we call Convergence North, where we had all the mayors and the chamber presidents from across northern BC and up into the Yukon come down and meet in Mackenzie, because the North was being left out at that point in time. And so I decided I was going to spearhead this, this conference and we're all going to converge and we're going to make a united plan for northern BC through that. And it was quite interesting, fantastic turnout. There was like 100 people from across northern BC that were there that were communi com communicating in focus groups. And they got a unified vision. And, and through that, in the early 2000s, a lot of things came to northern BC, that the, the whole doctor's program the, through UNBC was started and um, actively soliciting doctors for rural communities and strategic plans are made to recruit doctors, to, to go outside the country even to recruit doctors. So a lot of things that have come to fruition over the last decade and a half have actually come out of that conference whereby they all had one platform. And I, I firmly believe that if we all have a united and calm voice to say, we need this, we, our communities need this, we're struggling, we need to have things for our community. And if we can all get together on a united front and lobby it at every level, at business, at nonprofit, at municipal governments, regional district governments, that we can get so much more for our area. I firmly believe if we work to keep our communities strong, then all communities can be strong. All right. Well, let's bring it around to, to Valemount specifically. When, when did you, how long have you been here? Uh, uh, talk about maybe your family and what you're doing for a living now. Um, I'm retired now. I have, we have four generations living in this community. We've, we've moved here in 1993, and so we've owned property in the community since 1993. My partner's family were here longer than that, and we actually moved up here to join them. I am not on employed, I volunteer. I think that if, if you're retired and you have the time and the energy and the knowledge to give to your community, you should. And so I volunteer a lot. Okay. And Great, well that's, that's a good snapshot of you. Uh, now at this point we're giving all of the candidates up to three minutes to um, make some opening remarks or opening statements. And if you would just look into this camera right over my shoulder there and speak into there uh, whenever you're ready. When I look around Belmont, um, I recognize the fact that it is an economically depressed area, that there's people who are struggling for affordability. And to me, affordability has three planks to it. It has housing, it has food, and it has childcare. And if those three things are addressed, either on an independent or collective basis, then living in this community is affordable, it's doable, and it's achievable, and the community can remain strong. So for me, it's always been addressing the issues of affordability through those three things. And I would like to continue to do that. I'm, I'm quite knowledgeable about uh, geographical development, economic development, and I think that I can bring my expertise that I have in those areas to the community. I had taught a, a course to Newfoundland mayors and government officials on rural economic development and spent three days with them teaching them economic development. And I think that those skills that I had that I learned in universities, I can bring to the table for this community and, and benefit it. Great. Well, thank you very much. So we'll get into the questions now. We've kind of broken them into uh, topics. Uh, first topic is on housing which of course is very important to, at this time in Valmont. We are in a um, serious housing shortage, if not uh, crisis, as some people are calling it. It's affecting home buyers, it's affecting renters, uh, anyone seeking affordable housing, seniors. It's kind of a broad uh, range of housing options that are necessary right now. It's a serious situation that makes it um, not only difficult for locals, but for those people coming here to uh, look for work. Uh, I spoke uh, with uh, Holly Blanchett who was talking about nurses coming in, not being able to find places to live and not being able to work here. And I've heard stories about that uh, from other people as well in other occupations. So we have a, we have a challenge ahead of us here to, to deal with housing. The current council has taken some action on this. In uh, the fall of 2016, they struck the Affordable Housing Committee um, to deal with housing data collection, uh, funding of projects, strategic planning, zoning, bylaws, that type of thing. So we have two questions. Oh, and uh, the second thing that they did was, uh, I can't recall exactly, about six months ago, they put aside, in principle, um, 
land for an affordable housing project to, to, at a location to be determined. So they, they've t taken some steps towards that. We have two questions on housing. The first one is, what do you believe the role of municipal government is in addressing housing issues we have been and will continue to face? And then after you speak to that, we'll talk specifically about ideas about housing. The municipal government, through its ability to allot land, can, can set aside land to be developed. They, they can work in partnership with the provincial government, which has a new, under the new BC housing platform, has initiatives for communities to, to build a single occupancy as well as family, independent family dwellings. I think that there could be a mixed model uh, that is lobbied for on, by the municipal government towards BC Housing, to work with BC Housing, to work with the, the VARs in the community and have the best of all worlds. We can have condos, we can have duplexes, as opposed to individual single dwellings. It's, to me, it's, and it, it could even be a cooperative model in that aspect. It, it would be up to the village to, to help those who know what the needs are to stand behind them firmly and to support them in their endeavors, not to work at cross purposes with them, to, to really stand behind those that are in the know. There's people in this community that have been part of the Rural Housing Initiative. Uh, Riette Kinkel is one of those that has, and her and I have sat on, on the Rural Housing Initiative that's through um, Columbia Basin Trust and Selkirk College. And to rely on those people that are really invested in it, that have the time and the energy, and to support them. When, when they ask for something, the council should say, we'll do our best to help. Okay, great. The second part of this, second question on this is, what do you think council should be doing uh, in the next four years to deal with Vermont housing issues, and what specific plans on housing would you bring to the table if elected? Well, I think I covered that a little bit in the, in, in the first part of the question. I think that with their land allotment, that if if they made the regulations in such a way that it could accommodate different size structures, perhaps tiny homes, laneway homes, changing the bylaws in that regard so, so that property can have a small cottage in the back, um, with the bylaws could be changed in respect to the the, the, the travel people that want to come here, the people want to short-term rentals, mm -hmm. re vacation rentals and, and those things. I think that, that the bylaws should be changed to accommodate that kind of a measure, that even putting in basement suites and, and those kinds of things or a, a little offside laneway house for in-law suite, that type of thing, that there can be immediate things done as well as working on the, big, the bigger projects. And that's the direction that I would go. I would, I would look to see what can we do, what needs to be changed to facilitate for the different type of housings, the different type of people's needs. I would want to listen to the people who have the ideas in the community and help them bring those ideas into fruition because I would be their voice in the community. Okay, excellent. Let's move on to our second topic, which is uh, economic development uh, slash economic diversity. Uh, Valmount, uh, as you know, has been growing in terms of the number of homes being sold, the number of homes being built here, uh, and some new businesses opening as well. Tourism has also been on the rise. Um, however, there's still a lot that can be done in terms of uh, fostering future growth, particularly in the business side and the industrial side. Uh, so we have two questions uh, on economic development and diversification. The first one is, uh, what are your ideas for stimulating economic development in Bailmount? So this is kind of a broad strokes question, but what, is your, what are your ideas? Wow. Now, economic development is kind of a catchy situation. We could rely on business to do economic development. We could partner with nonprofits and respect economic development because to be quite frank in this community, it's nonprofits who have been the mainstay of our economic development. It's the people who are committed through their nonprofit organizations to build destination tourism venues. From the ski hill to cross country skiing to the marathon out at Mount Robson, those are all economic drivers. However, we should move along and to be more open-minded about what industrial things, uh, secondary, tertiary industrial things that can be done. I would like to see, as part of our economic development, lobbying for a hospital in this community, whereby we've done such a stellar job, the Diagnostic Center and all the staff and doctors there are doing such a 
fabulous job with training medical professionals in this community that we could expand that. We could have a small operating room where children could be born in this community. There would be net jobs gained in this community through making it a training center perhaps even for emergency medical um, staff whereby we have so many accidents here in the winter time. There's so much training that can go on. We, we could become a hub. We, you know, we, everyone says this population is small, but it's not. When we have over 40,000 people going by in our highways per day, we need to have a hospital. We need to have a, a, a medical place where they can go, where we can train medical professionals, where we can help be, help Northern UNBC. To, to train medical professionals in rural health medic and in emergency care. Then I would like to also have a look at the industry of hemp manufacturing, product manufacturing. This area is a very good area to grow hemp. You know, aside from all the hoopla about the aspects of marijuana that people are talking about, to me, I'm not interested in any of that. I'm interested in looking at it from an industrial development standpoint, whereby the sand in this valley and uh, is a good growing climate for, for hemp production in this valley. Not only that, it's an environmental thing. So we could be having, in the burn areas that we have, they, it could become huge hemp manufacturing. We can go into paper, to, to the development of a paper manufacturing if we have hemp production here. We need to get away from the old models. We need to bring in the new models for industry of what we can do. Plus, we need to support the fiber industry that we have here through community forests. It was, if we can get a mill here or work in some kind of fiber in that aspect, it could, we could help our environment. We could deal well with, with the changing and the shifting sands of this community. So for me, going into a really strong industry that, that can be developed, that we can be the leaders, it was, is, is, is foremost. I was, a few years back, I was at a Chamber of Commerce uh, business development session, and it was this fellow that, that was very far seen, and, and, he was, and he was talking about in the rural areas of, of BC, in, in, in particular the north, from, from Williams Lake North, about what we could do to develop a hemp industry for ropes, to get away from plastics, to get into clothing, and all these things. So if we could become a hemp manufacturing, because we have the arable land for it, we have the areas that are burnt out that need to have really good root systems developed again. So for me, exploring the hemp industry would be a really good thing for this community. Not so much the medicinals or recreational, for me it's an industry, not. Okay. Well, I, I think you've kind of touched on this in your answer was fairly wide ranging. And the second part of the question is, what is your def definition of economic diversity and how do you see that unfolding here in Vail Mount? Oh, economic diversity is something that we're lacking currently uh, because our community plan is based around tourism. So if you hitch your wagon to one tourism star, then if tourism collapses for some reason, then we have nothing. Then all what people have worked for in this community to build up the tourism industry is for naught. And it doesn't take very much to cause a tourism industry collapse. Mm -hmm. So for me, the diversification is into sustainable, into a sustainable system whereby forestry, uh, health care, those kinds of things stay stable. It's, it's a stable, industry so we have a diversified economy maybe based on three or four things instead of one solo aspect. Right, okay. Let's move on to our third topic which is uh, air quality. According to the BC Lung Association's 2017 State of the Air report, Valmont had the worst measured air quality in all of BC in 2016, which is the, the last year that data is available for, with nearly double the provincial annual average for PM 2.5 emissions, exceeding the provincial baseline of 25 micrograms per cubic meter on 72 out of 365 days. And there were no uh, wildfire smoke advisories uh, issued during the summer of 2016. So the question is, do you have a plan for addressing this important health concern of poor air quality for Vail Mount? And if so, could you provide the specific actions you would recommend to help alleviate the situation? Well, for me, air quality is extremely important. For the first time ever in my life, I've had to get an inhaler 
for this year for with with the air quality we've had partially to do with the fires that we've had but not only that to do with the silica sands that blow off the lake i have an extremely I think that there needs to be something done with the silica sands that blow off the lake. It fills the, the, the valley with unbelievable amounts of silica sand and, and that needs to be looked at. But I think the regional district, I touched on this last night at the All Candidates meeting, the regional district also needs to be involved because it's out in my area, which is in the regional district where I live, there's burning that goes on of plastics and I watch it just wafted past my house and down into the to, into into Belmont. I, I watched the burning on West Ridge and around on the on the valleys, and that smoke just seems to blow over and collect. I would like to have more attention paid to what's going on outside the community as well as inside. And in respect to the idling, the vehicle idling, if you drive down Karis Drive with with the semis and things during the winter time, is just incredible and then when it's 35 below 40 below every semi and there could be 20 of them is going all night long all night long all day long it's an issue and so for me realistically people are going to burn wood so if we can get a part of of a affordable wood stove conversion whereby cattle converters and wood stoves. Like our wood stove is extremely energy efficient. It, it reburns everything. There's almost zero emissions that come out of it. But not all people can afford that. So if we can actually find a program or find funding in some way, shape or form to help the residents change over that's, that's affordable, that's cost effective for us all, we can do that. To, to say, to have a burning ban or anything in this community, I don't think is feasible. Uh, I think that it would be uh, causing affordability issues that we already have in this community. So we need to have non-idling strategies. We need to have uh, a regional wide around the area of, of the interface areas with the community because it seems to, the downdrafts come off the mountains and it just pushes all the smoke right into the, into the village hub. And I think that that needs to be taken into consideration as well. I don't know what it would look like in partnership with the regional district, whether we would have one person that would monitor the air quality of the burning to make sure that people are looking at the charts, whether they should be burning that day or whether they shouldn't. But a model could be worked out, in my view. Okay, thank you. Let's move on to uh, topic four. So this is kind of a multi-faceted question dealing with leadership, communication, uh, openness, transparency. Uh, being a counselor, as you know, it requires numerous skills. For example, leadership, uh, consensus building, effective communication, the ability to take Vermont's concerns to other levels of government, sometimes forcefully uh, to make them listen, uh, and also the willingness to listen uh, and to respond to the concerns of Vermont residents in an open, fair, and a transparent manner. So we have two questions on this topic. The first one deals with the position of Chief Administrative Officer for the Village. Um, it's an important one. That individual is responsible for managing the affairs of the village. They also manage all of the staff, and they are the single liaison between council and the, the village staff. So they are the, the one employee that, uh, that council has direct uh, input over. In the last seven years, there have been seven CAOs and or interim CAOs uh, in the village resulting in hiring and termination costs to the taxpayers as well as instability in village operations because you keep having turnover and bringing new people in and and the the learning curve to get up to speed with the, the position here if elected as a councillor what would you do to try to help avoid this constant turnover in this critical key cao position oh the, the ceo is just such a primary and um important job position and there's the will of the people and there's what can be legally done under the community charter under the laws of everything and so any CAO that was hired has that expertise council needs to trust the fact that they know what can be done and say you know I I you, I don't care if, 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 if a councillor or the mayor says I don't care what can be legally done I want it pushed to be found to be a way. I, do, I don't think that that's a good thing. Personal agendas should never ever play a part in, in staff. It's, it's the staffing is there because they're committed to what their jobs are doing. They've gone and at immense expense 
to get their education. They're not there to lead their community astray. Their, their jobs are there to keep the community strong and good, to keep the community on track. And that respect needs to be given by mayor and council to uh, the paid employees. The turnover rate, because you're not liking what they're saying, should never happen. And this brings into question of, of what the outflow happened with, with all that turnover. I think that accountability and transparency uh, in communities, in committees of council and all that went downhill. So there became more of a, a individualistic agenda and there was no governance given to the mayor and council for their committees and council or the committees that they do that were uh, abiding by community charters, that were abiding by ethics, were in, by non-conflict of interest. I think that we need to refocus back to conflict of having a conflict of interest needs to be declared. Well, we're going to talk about that in oh, our next question. But, okay. okay. And and so so for me, it's respect your staff. We train them. We pay them. We don't need to pay to get rid of them. We don't need to pay to train more. We need to work with them in a conciliatory manner, because this is what they're trained to do. Right. Okay, thank you. Second question uh, on this topic area is uh, communication. So during this council's term, no formal communications policy has been developed. As the town hall meetings that they were doing have been stopped. Uh, one of the media outlets in Belmont, and it's not VCTV, has had trouble getting information from the current mayor. Uh, and council has not done anything uh, to make it any easier for the residents to communicate and to participate in the, in the process uh, with mayor and council. Uh, for example, and this is one thing that kind of personally bothers me, is if you want to speak, let, let's say there's a topic that's been ongoing for the past three or four council meetings and council's been debating it and there's been some pu public input into it. If you want to speak on the agenda to that topic, you have to get your uh, delegation request in to speak by noon on Thursday. However, the agenda is not released publicly until Friday afternoon, so you don't know whether that item is actually going to be on the agenda or not, or what items are going to be on the agenda. And there's no, there's no way to find out because it's not a public process for finding out what, uh, what is on the agenda. So there's that side of it. Uh, there's also the public comment section, and, and people have mentioned this to, this to me because I, I'm at every council meeting uh, for VCTV. And that is, there are public comments, uh, allowed at the council meeting, so they're in, at the very end of the council meeting, the very last item uh, on the agenda before uh, in camera if they have it. Uh, people are allowed to speak to anything that's been discussed in that agenda, in that evening's agenda, and they're given uh, two minutes to do so. The problem is that oftentimes they're commenting on items that have already been voted on or decided earlier in the meeting and not being able to have any feedback or any uh, give council any information on that prior to them sitting down to make a decision on it. Uh, some communities, such as McBride, have uh, approval of the agenda, approval of the minutes, public comments. And then the public can comment on things, presumably, that are on that agenda, or maybe anything. I'm not sure what the, what the guidelines are there. And then council can sit down and uh, debate whatever item they have to debate on the uh, Id on the agenda with some feedback from residents uh, already there. So it's uh, just a few things that I, that kind of I picked up on in terms of communication. The question for you is, uh, Rita, if elected, what would you do as a councillor to improve communications between the mayor and council, uh, Valmont residents, and the media as well, to provide a more open, fair, and transparent um, process that will engage people rather than deter them from participating? In my view, it's democracy is foremost. We're elected to be the voice or the representative of the community. We're not there for our own personal agendas. So for me, I was quite disappointed when the Community Initiatives Committee decided not to put permanent cameras and sound systems into the council chamber. I think it is extremely important that all committees of council, it doesn't matter whether it's tourism or community forests if they're meeting there or community initiatives, that all those meetings are filmed. People can see them, not just on Thursday nights and Saturday nights looking at the council meetings that happened on Tuesday. I think that all committee meetings need to be um, taped 
and the, com the, the community. And, and not only that, I recognize the fact that for VCTV, let's say if you're taping them, that it's community service at this point for you that, that VCTV is doing this. But for me, the council and mayor should be so invested in having their community informed, because information is power, that there should be money allocated on a budget line item for VCTV to cover the committees and council, that, that they should be there, that, that people should see what was, what was talked about in Tourism Belmont, that they should see who made what decisions at the community initiatives, and, and t so they know. So they, if, if they know what's going down, then they can talk to the people. They can address the mayor and council beforehand, prior to, they know what's coming down the pipe. They're engaged, they're involved. So for me, that would be primary. Would be, I would want to advocate for everything to be open and transparent in that respect. And at, for the, the community engagement at council meetings is appalling to, to be relegated to, and I said at the very end, you know, it's if there's a line item that's coming up and there's four people there that want to discuss Section 3 on clean air, that the people address that. When the, the, when the mayor and council are going to, to go to vote on it, there should be a dialogue between the community and the mayor and council, not after the fact. It should be done before that fact. There's, there's way too many personal agendas that, that, that went on in the last four years. The first year wasn't bad, but the last three years for, for um, personal agendas and lack of transparency have just been outrageous on my part. There, there are things that happened that have occurred that should never have occurred in a municipal government in respect to transparency and conflict of interests. And I think that if the council and mayor really understand that they're representing the community, then we'll have that transparency. And the best indicator of future behavior is past behavior. So if, if you're going to have a mayor and council that wants to fight for transparency, they would have already done so. They wouldn't have closed ranks and had secret meetings before committees and council and those types of things. I would like to see that all abolished. It's, it needs to be open, it needs to be transparent, and the community needs to be informed. Maybe right even down to um, participating with the newspapers, the two of them in town, and having a newsletter, or the village is doing this, where it's, you know, I see they have a Facebook page now, which they never had before, but that kind of pales into direct democracy where people get to talk. All right. Okay, thank you. We'll talk a, a little bit more on this um, issue of transparency in our next topic, which is conflict of interest. Uh, on May the 26th of 2015, during this last council's term, village staff presented uh, policy number 64 to council, which was an enhanced local conflict of interest policy for councils as recommended by BC Solicitor General. The Local Government Management Association and the Union of BC Municipalities believe that enhanced clarifications of conflict of interest guidelines may be needed now in light of the BC Court, Appe Court of Appeals Schlenker decision, which deals with two councillors uh, on Salt Spring Island who are found to be in, co in conflict of interest. Yeah, I'm familiar You're with familiar that. With it? Great. Yeah. And have introduced uh, a number of considerations for staff and elected officials when it determining when elected officials may be in conflict of interest. And some of these are contrary to the provisions that are in the community charter, which is what Belmont is using now, the provisions of the conflict provisions in the community charter. Policy 64 was narrowly adopted by a three to two vote with Councillor Reimer and Mayor Townsend opposing. Uh, then uh, about six months later, on January the 12th, 2016, that policy which had been adopted was rescinded by a three to one vote with Councillor Salt opposing with the rec recommendations that the Council of Interest guidelines uh, contained in the Community Charter under Part 4, Division 6, be used as they had been in the past. So we've gone back to the, con rather than having the, the local guidelines that were established, we've gone back to the conflict of interest uh, from the Charter. So the question is for you then, do you believe that the conflict of, do you believe that conflict of interest guidelines stronger than those contained in the Community Charter are necessary? And if you, and if you do, uh, would you support once again putting forth a locally tailored set of conflict of interest guidelines and definitions? Yes, yes, and yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, it's, it's, I watched uh, 
with interest what was transpiring on Salt Spring Island with, with, the, being, with the councillors being on the water board and money going to the water board and those kinds of things and, and what came out of that. There was also another conflict of interest that happened in Grand Forks with, with respect to water meters and water meters going in and, and how it was impacting one of the councillors' businesses. And there was a big legal challenge in that respect as well. I think that uh, the conflict of interest in this community needs to be stronger than what the community charter is. I don't believe that the community charter is strong enough to compensate it, especially in small communities whereby so many people belong to so many things. That, that you know, we have people involved in real estate that are on council. We have people that are involved in nonprofit organizations that will be on council, which myself, I would be too, uh, of course, if I was on council. However, if we're going to be ethical and and, and have the correct voice for the community, there needs to be extremely strict conflict of interest in a smaller community. I believe the smaller the community, the stronger the conflict of interest law should be. Okay. Yeah, uh, particularly in light of some of the uh, legal opinions I read uh, following Schlenker, and that was that in the past, uh, when you and I have been on committees, uh, there's been one cardinal rule about conflict of interest. You, you don't participate in anything that would benefit you financially or your family or friends yep. in that way. That's Everybody knows. That's kind yep. of a common sense thing. But now the, the opinion is that in addition to not being voting on something where you're a director of a society or an executive member of a society, you shouldn't even be voting if you're a member of that, of that society, society because they believe that the society itself is getting benefits. And so you're, you're crossing a, a line there to, to get benefits for, your, for the society that you're a member of. So it's a very uh, gray area. There's still no hard and fast rules. However, the Solicitor General says, why not err on the side of caution and have stronger conflict of interest guidance, and you support that. I absolutely support that. It's For me, when I was the chair of the Community Adjudication Committee and sat on it, I, I'd sat on, I was part of a member of, of numerous community organizations, and I scrupulously removed myself from that. Not all people did that. They didn't believe that they were in conflict. However, decisions were found out that, well, they benefited such and such an organization, or this or that, and and that breeds uh, an intimidating environment. If 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 there's perceived bias on the part of council, then then it dampens other community participations because God forbid you speak up against conflict of interest here, then you can be penalized over here. So it it dampens, and it and it's it's if if you don't adhere to conflict of interest. It inhibits democracy, in my view. Okay, great. Thank you. Let's move on to a, a new topic, and this is uh, the topic of Rainbow Crosswalk and inclusion. Um, according to Vancouver's Georgia Strait newspaper, as of July, uh, sorry, June 11th, 2018, there are now 42 rainbow crosswalks in British Columbia. On July the 26th of 2016, Valmount Council voted against installing a rainbow crosswalk here, citing cost and safety concerns. Uh, Prince George installed one uh, of uh, that's actually multiple crosswalks in a, in a in an intersection at a budgeted cost of six thousand dollars using a cold fusion technology, which is a long-lasting uh, kind of technology. Prince Rupert installed a, a typically uh, painted uh, one for eighteen hundred and fifty dollars, and you you probably recall during that debate that. Uh, uh, some of the proponents of the Rainbow Crosswalk offered to purchase the paint and do the painting themselves and do the repainting as necessary uh, in terms of mitigating the cost to the village. A uh, study conducted, conducted by the City of Edmonton on safety showed that there had been no safety problems with their six Rainbow Crosswalks. They found that the crosswalks did not decrease uh, pedestrian safety. And our research here at VCTB shows that uh, Valmont is only one of three communities in British Columbia that have voted against rainbow crosswalks, the other two being Merritt and Campbell River. So the question for you is, uh, given that rainbow crosswalks are seen as a recognition that a community is seen as, uh, considered as LGBTQ2 plus friendly, if elected, would you support the installation of a rainbow crosswalk on a public street in Valmont, and why or why not? Well, first of all, I'll say I thought hiding behind costs and danger and all those kind of things was really abysmal. There's too much evidence, as you've recited here, to the contrary. I believe that if we're going to have tourism as an industry, that we need to be open and inclusive, not only to the people in this community, 
which is the far reaching. Tourism is an industry we don't want to exclude. Why would you exclude a demographic that you want to come to this community? So for me, setting that whole situation up made us appear not to, to be accepting, not to accept diversification. And whatever I can do to achieve diversification in this community, I will do. May it be a rainbow crosswalk or any kind of other example of diversification. Okay. And, and that's where I, the way I feel. I think what you say about tourism is very true. You just have to look down the road to Jasper and see what they've done. You know, yeah. uh, one of the, the national parks and, and one of the busiest parks, and uh, they uh, are all over inclusion and uh, being yeah. friendly and open. And, and and why would you exclude a demographic, a huge demographic? Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you're going to have tourism industry, then make the decision to have tourism as industry. Don't exclude demographics of any type. It doesn't matter. It's, we're not exclusionary. We're, we say yes. Inclusionary. Right? Yeah. Right. Let's uh, move on to topic seven. We talked about it, uh, you talked about it a little bit earlier, and that's cannabis. Uh, as everyone knows, cannabis uh, becomes legal in less than two weeks mm -hmm. here in Canada, uh, recreational use. It could potentially have a major impact on Valmont on a number of fronts. Uh, municipalities across Canada are considering their options, and the options are all over the place uh, mm -hmm. in terms of it. The two-part question is, if elected, would you support and encourage entrepreneurs to start up marijuana retail outlets here in Valmount, or support only sales through um, BC government cannabis stores, or are you in favor of banning the sale of recreational uh, marijuana in Valmount outright? And we'll get to the other question in a second. Well, first of all, you can't ban the use of recreational marijuana in Valmont outright. No, the, the yeah. sale. We're talking the, about the sale. sale. Right. Okay. Um, no, I, I think that why would we do that? It, it's why would we be exclusionary? It, that's again exclusionary because if you're going to have uh, entrepreneurs and you're going to have business development, then do it. Be business wise. There's so many opportunities. Uh, if, if Valmont itself wanted to go into it, I mean, it, there's nothing saying that Valmont, the village of Valmont, could have set up its own dispensary if it wanted to and have it as additional tax revenue. I'm not saying that as a councillor I would be in favour of that, but I think that if entrepreneurs want to come in and do that, then our tax base needs that. That's an interesting concept. <laughs> well, it, it's true. It's possible. It, it, it's, it's I just had never occurred to me. It, it, it's absolutely true. I mean, if the, if, if, why not? I mean, if the government of Canada is going to make money off of it, or the BC government is going to make money off of it, in return, the municipal government could make money off of it. So it would be up to the people to communicate what kind of model they would like to see happen and have it investigated for them. You know, whether they want to be um, municipal BC government supply like the liquor store, or whether or not they would like to have a liquor store do it as well as the wine and beer store kind of model, that would be up to the community to decide. I, in my view, I, would, I think that there would have to be community input into which model that we're going to do once the facts come out on the ground. Right. Okay. So you, you uh, you're not in favor of banning the sale. You're in favor of uh, more information and seeing what what potential uses could be there. Yeah. Um, what about the? It, it, we talked about that side of the sales. What about use? So, part of of a, ma a major part of what a uh, municipality is is keeping residents safe. Um, so they have to determine what things w will be allowed. For example, you can't have alcohol in public places and public parks. Marijuana is, is being somewhat treated by the, the BC government, by the government of Canada, as an alcohol comparative, I guess, mm -hmm. in terms of that. Do you think that a usage uh, in public areas should be limited? Uh, for example, near schools, near playgrounds, in public parks, uh, that type of thing? Well, I think you can't smoke anywhere. In, on, on public property, you know, and, and you know, you might see people smoking out in front of the brewery or things like that. If the community wants to have open regulations, I see the, the Vancouver Park Board just relax the laws in, in um, consumption of alcohol at Kitts and another North Van Beach. So if, and to have alcohol consumption. So if they're relaxing the laws there, where are you going to go with that? You know, so for me, Again, I think it's a community decision. It's it's if we're not ha if we don't have smoking in community parks, then we don't have smoking in community parks. If we don't have alcohol consumption in community parks, then we don't have alcohol consumption. And if people want it to be different, 
then they will approach, in my view, the mayor and council to have things changed. Okay. The other part of that is, and we haven't discussed it really, is what do you believe the law should be on growing, mar uh, growing cannabis uh, in Valmount proper? I understand that the regulations allow four plants for personal, uh, personal use. Well, I think that would be up to the property owners themselves. It, if, if, if they want to grow four plants, then grow four plants. If it's, if it's a landlord tenants, uh, it would be up to the landlord whether or not to allow it. I don't think the tenants would have a right to overweigh what the landlords want just because they're allowed to grow four plants. So I think that it's an individual choice. Uh, for me, it's just an individual choice across the board. I, I don't think that the village needs to say, are, are you brewing wine in your basement? You know, are you are you brewing beer in your basement? Or you know, it's to me, it's it's an equivalency. You know, we're not going to say you're not allowed to to grow a keg of beer. You know, or or, or right. so for me, if people want to grow four plants, I think that it's none of the village's business sure. to get involved in that aspect. I think the only possible areas would be in terms of safety, um, but I don't think you need, uh, you know, hydroponics to grow four plants, plants. or, yeah. you know, I don't think there will be uh, odors emanating from four plants. Uh, yeah. You know, if you had a grow op per se, yeah. then that's yeah. illegal anyway. Yeah, so. but the grow ops are illegal. So if you want to grow four plants in your garden, grow four plants in your garden. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, to, to me, it's, it's individual choice and individual's business. I, I don't want, I, I as a counselor would not want to trample on that. I don't want to know if people are making wine in their basement. Unless they offer you a glass. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, okay. true. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, let's move on to our next topic. So this is uh, on traffic, uh, congestion, parking issues in two, two specific areas. The question is, uh, what are your thoughts regarding the traffic conge congestion and parking issues on Karis Drive? And I believe they're speaking of the corner of, of, of where the Tim Hortons, Petra Cannon on Fifth Avenue just off the highway is. And also the Main Street business area. Uh, I take it from the question they're talking about uh, area outside of the Swiss Bakery where vehicles are parking on the shoulder, kind of halfway on the on the road and on the shoulder, et cetera, and creating some uh, issues there. Those two areas, what do you feel could be done to um, improve the situation? Oh, if we're going to get busier, there has to be something done. It's for me driving down Main Street going past the Swiss Bakery just to get to the Lions Hall is sometimes a challenge. It's taken me several minutes to get from just past the Lions Hall, to the Legion, to the Lions Hall because of the traffic that's pulling out and people that are pulling out and trying to cross the street and you're going like five kilometers an hour, you're almost getting hit. Uh, it would be incumbent upon the village, in my view, is to um, maybe in the downtown core have better facilitated community parking whereby there's an actual place for RBs. You know, the, the corner there where IGA and IDA and, right. and the GOAT and stuff are. I mean, sometimes you can't even get a, a, a cross cedar there it's, or going across cedar because there's just motorhomes, motorhomes, motorhomes that are diagonally parked on the side of IGA there. I think that if we had a well thought out parking plan, there's the little bit of the parking space that's down fifth just past the gathering tree that they had allocated for parking. Uh, but most people don't know, and it's gravel. Right. Like, they don't know that it's there. So if, it's, it, if we have signage, like signage that says RV parking 1.5 kilometers to the left, and there's designated RV parking there, so people with RVs know where they're going to go. Because when you're coming a stranger into a strange town, you don't know where to park and you're going, oh my God, what a nightmare this is, where do I park? They don't know that this little strip of, of parking lot that's just down from the gathering tree there is for RVs to park. Mm -hmm. it's, not signed, it's not signed, it's not paved, pave it, put up a sign and say RV parking here. Have signage, designate it. Karis Drive, oh, that is, that, that whole intersection is so bad. I don't believe that there was any planning that went into that intersection putting the Tim Hortons and the Esso there. It's, it's the, the amount of traffic and the amount of traffic that's going by on the highways. I don't believe that there was a study that was done that 
took into consideration how much traffic was going to be there and how dangerous it was going to be. And it's just going to get more dangerous. There needs to be a frontage road that, that goes out that joins the highway there before the bridge. So there's just not one access, in, in my view. There needs to be a frontage road that has two access avenues that go out there to alleviate that. Mm -hmm. And that would encourage big trucks, discourage big trucks from coming in because at least they would park there so they can go out that frontage road area. There needs to be a secondary frontage road that, that goes out onto Highway 16 from that aspect. And the parking of the trucks, other than, I don't know what we can do in, in, in that aspect other than discouraging them from idling and make really strong bylaws about and have somebody actually say, you're not allowed. Go, you know, you're not allowed to do this. So for me, it's, it's either we're going to be open to having the trucker stop by and, and deposit money here and, and utilize our services, or we're not. So it needs to be a traffic alleviation, in my view, in some way, shape, or form to get them out from turning down fifth and going in and those type of things. Okay, good. Thank you. Well, that's all the uh, submitted questions we have for you. But one uh, written question uh, specifically for you. And um, that is, you have a varied background. We heard about it uh, when you were describing yourself at the beginning. A lot of experience in, in a wide range of fields, yet you've never run for political office uh, that I know of. Uh, why have you decided to run now? And what is the important, most important quality you feel you would bring to the table as a Vailmount counselor? Oh, I never really wanted to go into politics. It was, for me, it was just more working on the community level, making your community strong. And although I was recruited, I've, I've had people come out and talk to me from different organizations across Canada throughout my career and ask me if I would be interested in going political, and I didn't. And this was the third year that I was asked whether I'd be interested or not. And at that time, I thought, well, what can I do for this community? And then I realized there's three council that are leaving. That means there's three new members that are going to be coming on board as council. That's a significant loss of assets for the community with, with three voices that are going to be new. It's, it's, so if you're not well versed in the operations of government, of lobbying, of tourism, of grant writing, of seeking grants, of economic development, all that is lost. So for me, because I have expertise in those areas, I have participated at a high level lobbying and economic development, I felt that maybe the best way that I could help my community right now is to be their voice with this kind of educational background with, with three newbies going to be on council, so to speak. And uh, I was also concerned that at, at that time that I heard that there was not going to be any women. There could quite possibly be only be ending up one woman in the whole mayor and council. I'm, I'm thrilled that it's turned out that so many strong women have come out and decided to run as well. But I really feel that I can hit the table running, so to speak, because I've been part of the committees of council. I know what the granting streams are. I know what municipal economic development is about. I know what tourism is about and what housing is about and childcare and affordability and, and I've already worked in that field. So my learning curve won't be as steep as what others are. So there will be less dead time on council and things like that because the more people that you have that know what's going on on council, the better it is for the community. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Well, I uh, want to thank you very much for answering the questions. So now we have, uh, as we have with all the candidates, up to three minutes uh, for you to make a closing statement. Um, whatever you'd like to say, if you just want to talk into this camera whenever you're ready. For me, when I was looking at economic development in this community and what our potentials are, uh, I've been long interested in, in what we could do economic development here. But I looked back to see who was actually doing economic development in this community. And I realized that primarily it's nonprofits. From the, from the Rodeo Association, from Yora, from Varda, from the CBC, from the Lions, the Legion, VAX, all these, or the Mountain Days, all these organizations participate in economic development in this community. It's the people of this community who independently, perhaps, with just the supporting role by Tourism Valmont and, and the municipal government, who have done the economic development. And yet I find that their 
voice in this community has is not respected as to what it should be respected. That although business sits on tourism Valmount, uh, it's not recognized that nonprofits are tourism Valmont as well. I would like to see the nonprofit organizations in this community have a strong voice on mayor and council. I would like to see them be included at the economic development table because the ideas that have come forward in this community that, that have taken us to where we are economically developed now have come from those people. It's the rodeo association with the mud bog races, with the rodeo, with the destination weddings. As a Lions Club member, we have catered so many destination weddings down at the rodeo grounds. We've catered destination weddings out at Tijon Hall. So all these hundreds of people come to town, and they're bringing tourism dollars to this town, but yet the nonprofit organizations that provide the venues, that provide the services, and all these things aren't recognized for the economic development asset that they are. So you, you, we're not, we come forward with ideas and our ideas are not being represented or, or accepted the, in the manner that they should to be expanded because all the volunteers and all these nonprofit organizations love this community. They work for this community and to have them not respected is a loss. How much more could we have in this community if the ideas for economic development that the nonprofits are already working on, that have already taken baby steps, are not taken seriously. We're going to look to some outside business to come in and invest. Let's look at our own community. Help our nonprofits who are already doing this. Have more partnerships with them. Do more with them. Promote things with them. You know, it, it, it's just, there's so much that could be done with, with the venues that we have around this community if there is a will by the mayor and council to work in partnership and not to work as a silo saying, well, we need to have a multi-billion dollar do this and spend thousands of tens of thousands of dollars maybe working on a project that's not going to happen. Let's invest our time and appreciation and energy towards the groups and the organizations in this community that are already doing a good job. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, just want to tell people to please make sure to get out and vote. That's very important to uh, exercise your democratic rights. You have two opportunities to vote for mayor and council. Uh, the first would be at uh, advanced voting, which is going to be held uh, Wednesday, October the 10th, uh, from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. at the Village Council Chambers at 735 Cranberry Lake Road. Uh, if you don't want to do that, of course, the general voting day is Saturday, October the 20th, same hours from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., and that will be at the Belmont Community Hall at 101 Gorse Street. Um, great. Well, I thank you very much, Rita, for being here. Appreciate thank you for having me. Answering all my questions, and um, good luck to you in the election. Well, thank you so much. And thank you all for watching.